Hey everybody, welcome to another sit down with Michael Francis. Hope everybody's doing well. Everything is good on this end. And I got something very, very special today. Longtime friend that was the best man at his wedding twice. <laughs> he's never boring. He's always exciting. A little bit controversial, maybe a lot controversial, but he's got a great redemption story. I believe in him. I trust him. We go back 25 years. Hey, look, we all made mistakes. I made a bunch of them, did my time in prison, still make mistakes. But this is a real story of redemption. And I signify that. I qualify it. I put my stamp of approval. I'll sign on it. It's, uh, it's for real. You're going to enjoy it. Very, very exciting. He had something on Friday that uh, hopefully you tuned in. If not, you're going to tune in after you hear this interview. So with no further introduction necessary, my longtime dear good friend and brother in Christ, Barry Minkow. All the interviews, this is the one I've looked forward to the most. Oh, you've done a bunch so far. I've done a bunch. We've done a bunch. I give the Discovery Channel credit. They have a very aggressive public relations department. They've kept me quite busy. So King of the Con, as you know, started Friday, and we're very fortunate. It, it seems to be doing, doing well, and that's great. But the story, Michael, as you know, it was tough. It goes into, I'm narrating my evil. I'm narrating every evil, disgusting, filthy deceitful thing I've done, and that's not easy. Well, let me stop you there, yeah. because for people that don't know who you are, let's go way back, Yeah. and let me let me explain a little bit how Barry and I met. It was a long time ago. Yeah. Um, we met in prison, actually. 1988, let... the, the hole in Terminal Island. 1988, 1988. was it 88 or 87? It was 88 before MDCLA was even built. You and I okay. were in the shoe. Yeah, later in 91, we'll get to that later. Okay, so we go back that far. We met in the hole, he was a young kid then, Z Best Carpeting, if you weren't from California, you may not be too familiar, but those of you my age in California, Southern Cal, you know about Z Best Carpet. He had a ton of publicity. It was a huge, huge case, one of the biggest fraud cases in history. I think it might have even been bigger than mine. I don't know. But uh, it nobody, certainly was nobody's neck and neck. that good, Michael. No, you still But anyway, good. we're laughing about it now. We're not taking yeah. this, you know, a laughing matter. It is a serious situation. Uh, and we go back all of these years. We had a lot of history between us. But I'm going to let Barry explain how we met. Yeah, so I'm in the shoe in Terminal Island. And um, you were there. I was in maximum security because they thought I was trying to escape, even though I turned myself in. Mm -hmm. But then 60 Minutes aired, and there was a lot of publicity. How old were you? I was 21. 21 years yeah, old. January 1988. So the issue was with Zbest, you know, I was involved with the mob voluntarily. They didn't make me do it, but I had a couple families I was involved in that helped me go public. So they made money on the way up. Quickly explain Zbest carpeting. Quick. So yeah, so Zbest was a carpet furniture and drapery cleaning company. Started it out of my parents' garage. Got tons of publicity. Started out how old? It's 16 years old. That's why it got publicity. It was on Oprah. On the docu series covers this about how. You know, my first crime was to meet payroll, how I created a moral compass to justify evil. Well, I'll pay this back, and I'm just using this to meet payroll. I stole my grandmother's jewelry. We go over that. So really some low points when I was 16, 17 to raise money. 18, I'm involved in the mob. 19, 20, before I'm legally allowed to drink, my company's public on Wall Street. So it was the, worth how much? What was the valuation? Uh, at, at March of 87, 300 million, and I had 100 million of the stock. So that was the cure, right? If all I got to do is hang on till I could sell some of my free trading shares, two year restriction, and then I'll pay off the mob, and I'll pay off the Ponzi scheme and go legit, which was another lie. But every white collar criminal has a cure that makes the evil okay. Because it's just temporary. I'm only going to do it for a minute. I'm going to pay it back. Nobody's going to get hurt. And it's for a good cause. So yeah, let, that let was the moral comment. Let yeah. me stop you for a minute. I hope you understand what Barry is saying. He didn't set out to have a fraudulent company. He set out to do the right thing. But certain circumstances throughout started to change things for him. But he always felt, correct me if I'm wrong, I'll just do this one little thing, then I'll straighten it all out yeah. and everything will go the right way. That's right. And Am so right? for me at Zbest, it was if I just open another store. So we went from Reseda, Thousand Oaks, 
Anaheim, San Diego, Santa Barbara. I mean, the more stores I open, that's income. I'll get income. And with more income cash flow, I can cover this. Listen, the second mob loan I got was in a brown paper bag, 25000 in cash, twelve fifty a month, twelve fifty a week interest only. You can't overcome that. The loan I got from the uh, loan shark at the gym to start Z-Best when I was 16 years old was $1,600, 200 a week interest only. I was doomed but didn't know it right. to fail. Now, what I should have done is when I'm like 16, 17, say, you know what, I'm above my head. Let me revisit this in five years. I've failed. I can't do this. Refused, pride and ego. And just at 16 and 17, you can't open a bank account in California until you're 18. Right. So the mob was more than happy. I had some friends that I had met through my carpet cleaning, as you know, and indirectly. And then one of them I met as a customer and lent me money, got involved in those relationships to my detriment, but I did it voluntarily. Nobody made me. I'm responsible. And when I went, when it was all said and done, the organized crime people I was involved with had a million shares, free trading of ZBest that they got at five on the merger, five cents. They sold it all the way up to 18. And then when I was falling and they knew I was going under, I would have to have nightly meetings and tell them what was going on. And with that information, they shorted it on the way down. None of them ever went to jail. And that's when you say my life, because picture this, guys. Let me stop you. I got to tell that story. Yeah, I'm going to let you tell that story. But this is interesting. I think people need to understand this. You're 16, 17 years old. Yeah. Now, I was a street guy. Had you come to me with this deal that you had, I don't know if I would have given you the money. You probably would have caught Yeah, I think I was, you know what? The, the U.S. attorney said, there's no way this guy played the mob. And actually, they believe How the restoration. How did you get them to believe it? Listen, because fraud's the skin of the truth stuffed with the lie. ZBest really did have carpet, furniture, and drapery cleaning services in multiple locations. That's the skin of the truth. The stuffed with the lie was the restoration jobs. We claim to be restoring buildings that were damaged by wire, water and fire. Now, here's the irony of that. The irony of that is the mob thought I had an adjuster on the take so they said, well, we don't know, but the jobs are probably real. They're just super overinflated. They didn't exist at all. So they thought there was something to so it. So you they conned the mobsters. I did con I thought the guy was on the take, so I let him think that. Con the mobsters. I conned the mobsters. Okay, yeah. now, 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 now I have to make a point here. Let me tell you yeah. the difference between the Los Angeles mob. No, they were from the, New York. <laughs> No, well, they, do, well, we don't need to mention once, names. You once know. They, I know they're there. Once they come out here, they're different. Okay? That's <laughs> well, why we, we call them the Mickey Mouse mob out here. Guys in New York, we wouldn't have fell for that. Yeah, <laughs> I I, well, that right I was now. dealing with some guys from Rico Park. And, <laughs> Rico but anyway, Park. listen, the thing that happened was, and again, I was voluntarily involved with them. Um, when I get to prison in January of 88 in Terminal right, so you get indicted. The whole the oh, house of they God, stopped the programming when I got indicted. We interrupt this through. program. Yeah, they inter L.A. was like, I was the O.J. of 1988. Right. I mean, yeah, it I was bad. That. So they stopped programming. I get indicted. I turn myself in thinking that was going to help me on bail. It didn't. The judge I get is Judge Trevisian. David had his party, 80th birthday, David Kenner. Snoop showed up. Good judge. And Judge Trevisian was there. I gave him a big hug. He looks at my wife and says, Lisa, keep him out of trouble, would you please? Wonderful guy. All so right. at so the time, say, he wasn't so wonderful. Listen, Barry talks fast. He gave Judge Trevisian a hug just a couple of weeks ago. It was a, yes. It was a lawyer's wedding, but he was the original judge on his case. That's right. Going back 30 Giving me 25 years, years, and then wrote 25 a, years and then wrote a letter after a third of it say, to the parole board saying, let him out. So, yeah, great guy. I'm in prison. It's January 88, and a couple months later, you come in to Terminal Island, and I had uh, just made a decision to get rid of one lawyer, hire Brooke Lear and Kenner, and I explained to you the problem I had, that the mob thought I was going to- They gonna, wanted to kill you. They wanted to kill me. They thought I was going to cooperate with the government, even though I told them I wasn't, even though we had a plan that who I was to blame, they educated me on what to do when I got arrested, and uh, that I'd be okay. You sent the word out that he hired a mob lawyer, Tony Brooklyn's it was yeah yeah Father and Kenner mom, yeah right? and but David Brooklyn Kenner. yeah, and you also sent word out and immediately uh, we got word back and word get, does get back in federal prison yes. in maximum security that I was okay and I went to trial four and a half months lost no mobster ever went to prison for anything related to ZBest whether it be stock or anything none of them and so and just yeah. so everyone knows I took a liking to him I listened to him Tony Brooklier his father was a, a guy on the street well respected guy. And so he understood, and he hired, you hired him. David Kenner, another great guy, represented Suge Knight and a whole bunch of guys. My attorney, too, did some things for me. And uh, I made it clear to the guys on the street that you weren't going to hurt anybody, but you had to defend yourself at trial. So you were able to do that, even though you lost. 
But yeah. it was hands off of Barry. Nobody was allowed to touch him because if you did, you'd have to deal with the guys in New York. You don't want to do that. That's right. And it saved my life. And by the way, the defense, it was funny watching the U.S. attorney defending the mobsters in trial. You fooled them. So, yeah, yeah, it was, it was great. But anyway, Kenner had a great job. It's the difference between L.A. and New York. That was right there. You proved it. Got yeah. It. And, and so the z -Best crime, the takeaway there, Michael, was a moral compass that I was able to create. And I met a lot of people in federal prison who did the same. You know, we all, when we started our businesses, we never thought we'd end up in prison. That was a common denominator, like you had indicated. But we created a moral compass that made evil okay if we just had the right reason. I see that today in a lot of other areas. Absolutely. And you know, mutual friend, somebody I introduced you to, Bruce McNall, used to own the LA Kings. Yes. Great guy. I love Bruce. Just a good guy. Same thing. Got in over his head, did a couple of little things, you know, that, you know, that were, uh, I guess, illegal. And, uh, but always thinking that, okay, I can do this just till I get even, then I'll pay everybody. I'm not trying to commit a crime. So, exactly and, my and, thinking. And a good guy. And Bruce is in the, although, you know what? This is just between us. I don't know that if he made, there were three cuts to King of the Con. I don't think he made the U.S. Uh, Discovery Plus cut. And he's in that he was, they interviewed him because right. he's a friend, of course. Right. And yes, you're right. Bruce's story is another example of, creating a, a moral compass that allows temporary evil for a greater good. Exactly. And, and, and many people I met in prison did. So come out of prison. Um, but I, I want you yeah. to do something you said very interesting, Barry. You said that uh, a fraud is skin of the truth. Skin of the truth, stuff to the light. What I mean by that is in fraud uncovering, which we'll get to in a minute. Uh, th listen, at ZBest, we knew we had to pass due diligence by lawyers and accountants, so something had to be real. Right. So we had 1,400 employees, 23 locations, a chemical manufacturing facility, so we really did have the skin, and there was revenue. Mm -hmm. But the majority of the revenue didn't exist, but we were able to shift the due diligence focus from the fraudulent to the legitimate and infer the rest. So. Uh, no fraud. So when somebody says to me, well, they have this legitimate side. I said, every fraud has a legitimate side. We got to go below the iceberg. An iceberg, most of an iceberg exists below the surface, just like fraud, only a little bit's out. So only a little bit is true, but you got to go below the surface of a company or a scheme or an investment opportunity to find the fraud. Of course, they've probably refurbished a few houses or built a few buildings. Of course, they wouldn't be, but they're lying about what they owe and they lie about what they earn. That's white collar crime. Mm -hmm. Concealing debt, inflating revenue. That was the Z best accounting fraud. Exactly. And just, you know, I, I obviously <clears throat> I'm, I'm familiar with that. My whole gas scam operation. I mean, we had gas stations, I had over 350. We had trucks, we had wholesale licenses. I had accountants, I had lawyers. It looked like it was legit, but we were stealing tax money. We had no expenses. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> with us, yeah. It, was all, it was all revenue coming in. I mean, the government paid for everything, but uh. yeah. Imagine if you had tried the carpet cleaning route. Never mind. We don't need to go there. So uh, go to prison. By the way, all yeah. of this came out in King of Con. It, King Quite of Con covers this. Yes. Yes. And then the prison sentence that I got. The guidelines were forty to fifty-two months. I did one hundred and eight months, mm -hmm. and I'm in prison serving my time. So, you know, you see people in King of the Kong and they're saying, you know, one, my publicist from Zebes said, Barry ruined my life. I haven't seen her in 32 years and I have nothing but respect for her and I'm sorry of what she suffered. But one of the crew members came up to me and said, you know, that's why you did seven and a half years for Zebest. You, you did time because you hurt people. That's what you did. So mm -hmm. you've paid the price and restitution been paying for 30 years every month. But what happens in 91 is I'm in Inglewood, Colorado. It's a medium. Mm -hmm. And... You, my case manager calls me in, and, and this is in the middle of my bit there for the ZBest crime, and you, you're there. And we were friends, and, I, and they had violated you. I'll never forget when I, yeah, that's when, I, like a fool, okay, I made a mistake, violated my parole. On me, 100%. But I'll never forget when I saw you in Englewood. Your first thing was, Michael, and then you go, oh, man, like you were happy to yeah. see me, but mad that I was back in there. That's a true friend, by the way. Now, you don't know this because we didn't talk beforehand. So one of the things I, I remember, 18 days later, oh, they threw me in a hole. Yeah, that's true. Absolutely. I was in a hole. Yeah. And Navarro was there, too. There already, but he, we'll get to that later. <laughs> yeah. The irony of that meeting was in this docuseries, somehow when I was in prison uh, the second time between 2011 and 2018, a, a rumor got out there that Peanut didn't exist, that I just made him up. This Ving Rhymes played him in the movie. Right. So when you want to talk about things that really upset me in this docuseries was, I guess they had people on there doubting Peanut's existence. So, right. right. Well, well, not only that, I'm friends with his son, Jamar. 
Jamar has his own trucking company. Uh, he's doing fabulously. He has children. Uh, to, and I had Discovery talk to him, of course. And also, uh, I hired an investigator in like 2006 to find Jamar mm -hmm. because I, I knew, promised Pete and I'd take care of him. Well, the irony is you met him. You were there when, course, he, yeah. when we were cellmates. So I was, they were, I was thinking about Henry Crockett. I got his number in Vegas. Henry's like, I'll verify Peanut. I was right across the street. Yeah, so you actually have, up. this is the problem. I did the docuseries to stand up and say, this is what I did. I make no excuses. I paid a heavy price. Please don't follow in my footsteps. And oh, by the way, if you lie to get money, if you have violated a position of trust, if you've been cast off by society, if you feel like you have no hope, if you're an addict who can't recover, then this docuseries is for you because you're my people. That's who I'm trying to reach. Um, and I also want people on the other side who are in business to realize one thing, justifying is just a lying. Whatever moral compass you create to justify evil can be defined, and a great pastor, not me, once said it, justifying is just a lying. But what I didn't like was things that I had nothing to, listen, I've done my time, 15 years, uh, paid the price, came out and did this to admit everything I did, concealed nothing, and then somebody, you know, this, oh, well, peanut didn't exist. So I Who was, said that? Uh, uh, I guess, it, it started with an article in Fortune magazine where the writer inferred that while I was in prison, but then he found some guards that knew Peanut. And at one time, his name wasn't on the BOP locator. Now it is, James Long and Inglewood at that time. But uh, anyway, I don't know. They, but when I confronted the producer and the showrunner, they were very good and they said, Barry, listen, we confirmed Peanut existed. We had his son's phone number. We, we talked to the investigator. Of course we know he existed. But there's a different interpretation on the influence he had on your life because, as you know, he had a big influence on my life. But then I went back to prison so I'm thinking, well, you, yeah, you're entitled to that opinion, but you're not entitled to a set of facts to even infer that he didn't exist. So I didn't want to get, be held responsible for stuff that, that, that just wasn't true. Right. I wasn't going to fold on that. So especially Peanut, huge, uh, significant person in my life. Sure. And of all the odds, you're 18 days on the yard. And you knew Big Ron, you knew Peanut and me, you knew, Eric. yeah, 100%. you were right there and knew him. Has Peanut passed away? Yeah, he passed away in 93. And there's an article in the Washington Post about James Long's murder while he was on uh, Halfway House. We were going to start Glory to God Community Church together, mm -hmm. have an ethnically neutral church like we did in prison. We had plans. Then I went looking for his son, Jamar, later on when I got out of prison. And Jamar and I have been uh, friends ever since. He's wonderful. He's killing it with the trucking company. His dad would be so proud. So imagine so that, me that, watching that, people saying, well, peanut didn't exist. Barry invented them. Listen, I, 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 yeah, yeah, I invented restoration jobs. jobs. I violated a position of trust at the church and hurt people uh, horribly and, and deserved the time I got and more. But don't hold me responsible for things I had nothing to do with. So that was one thing you didn't like about it. Yeah. What was the other thing you didn't? By the way, it's a terrific show. Discovery did a great job. You should tune in on it, Discovery yeah. Plus. Uh, a three really hour did. docuseries. Three hour docuseries, did a great job. I saw a lot of bits and pieces, yeah. really liked it. And I think you're gonna enjoy it. And you're gonna get something out of it. It's a unique story, trust me. And you know what? I, I gotta say this, in today's climate, the government should love you because you committed a crime, you got caught, you did your time, you admitted to what you did, you're trying to redeem yourself. You have redeemed yourself, as far as I'm concerned, and a lot of other people out there. They should love you now, because today, people are committing crimes, getting out the same day, going back and committing another crime. They're not, there's no consequences anymore. In I our know. day, we had consequences. It, 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 I would say this in no other interview. I was watching TV. I'm like, where was this Philadelphia prosecutor when I was a crook? <laughs> <laughs> where was the New York Where, was the, where, was the, where were these bail laws? Anyway, the, when Trevisan said, yeah, no, 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 you're not. Larry, I got to say this. I went to trial five times. I've been arrested 18 times. I stood in front of five juries. In a Giuliani case, I faced 100 years, maybe more. He said he was going to give me 100 years. I was never even late for a court appearance, never late. When I get indicted on the uh, uh, gas tax scheme, another racketeering case, I turn myself in. I turn myself in. No bail. I'm not a flight risk. It was a white collar crime, basically. Right. It was a racketeering case, but it was a fraud. No bail. Today, oh, you can go God. rob a store. You know, in New York now, today, you rob at gunpoint. You're out, out the next day. Out the next day. So the, this is a very anyway, important. I, this, I no, no, it's a critical point, point you made. Point. Let me tell you why. In our case, and, and you weren't dumb enough to be a two-time loser like me. In our case, I did seven and a half years, was out for 16, 
So under the federal rules of criminal procedure, what did that make me? A first time offender, if you're out for 15. So I go in front of Judge Sites. Mm -hmm. It's Miami, July uh, 2011, for sentencing for the insider trading Lennar thing, which was a part of the church conspiracy, which I ultimately got 10 years for. Judge Sites looks at this and says, well, two things here, Mr. Minko. First, it says you're a first time offender because you've been out 15 years, but I know you're not. <laughs> and then second, the SEC wrote a letter to the judge, it's a public record, uh, confirming 11 or so frauds that I had uncovered during that time, totaling a billion dollars. Wait, wait, say that again. Frauds that he uncovered, not that yeah. he committed, because you were right, working right, right, right. to so, uncover yeah, frauds. During the, the, and listen, during the church time, one of the major justifications for commingling funds, and the, by the way, this is not an excuse, and it's evil. So let me be clear. But what I was saying to myself was, because 60 Minutes, you know, in 2005, did this wonderful story on all these frauds we'd uncovered, and I started the Institute in like 2000, 2001. So for a long period of time, I was commingling funds, justifying, saying, well, the church is growing, so that's good, and I'm uncovering fraud. The government ain't paying me. Man, I just went to Bermuda, went undercover, uncovered the Derek Turner fraud, which they made a movie on in New Zealand, and they didn't pay me. So, heck, I... Um, uh, I can do this it's because it's for the greater good and I'll eventually pay it back. So this habit, this, this justifying is just a lying mentality. But you know what? I knew who I was when nobody was looking. I was preaching on Sundays, Saturday nights and Sundays. Church was growing and my drug use. Uh, I was using 325 milligrams of Oxycontin a day, documented, because I went twice to rehab secretly. Nobody knew, but the feds found out and that's why I got the RDAP program and to appease my conscience because I knew I was living a double life, having an affair, uh, violating a position of trust, betraying my congregation who was nothing but wonderful and good to me. And I was living a double, and justifying it as like, well, I, I am uncovering fraud, the church is growing, I'll fix it. Uh, just, and it caught up to me. And over the years, beginning in like 99, 2000, I started Vicodin, escalated to Oxycontin, and uh, if it was today, I'd be dead because of fentanyl. So okay. yeah. hold on a minute. Barry talks very fast. His mind works fast. I know this. Happens to be a brilliant guy, and I will say that. And I'm not saying it because you're here. You made a lot of mistakes, but you're a very smart guy. But here's the thing. While he was in prison first time around, he went to Bible college. He came out. He uh, was an associate pastor. I and got an MD. Church. Yeah, he got an MD. He was, and, and by the way, he gets out after seven years on a 25-year sentence. Minimum amount of time because he earned it. And I don't know anybody that got out, you know, in a minimum in federal in a, and that a was federal the sentence. Yeah, remember, it was the yeah. old system. Exactly. Old, yeah, Except for guidance. me. I got out in 42 months, first time around on 10. But uh, he did his work in there. He let his time work for him. He comes out. He becomes a pastor. Eventually, he pastors his own church in San Diego. Community Bible Church, I believe, yeah. built the church up. I know I spoke there a couple of times. Every time you speak with Barry, you got to get him off the stage because he talks too much. But anyway, <laughs> he let me talk. Uh, and, and, we, and he was building the church because he was tremendous at what he did. Then he got involved with uncovering frauds because he understands frauds, and he started to uncover them. He had the Fraud Discovery Institute. Was and that he warned me not to yes. do it. Yes, and I warned him. I said, don't Barry, do don't do it. You're not a cop. Don't start getting into that thing. He came to me. He said, we can do it together. I said, no, I'm not doing that. Yeah. That's not my role in life. And I even told him, I said, if you make one mistake, it's going to be a problem. Well, he made that mistake. Not, you know, bad intention, but he made that mistake. During that time, he got involved in Oxycontin, whatever the yeah, drugs yeah, are. I don't yeah. want to tell you. He started taking drugs. Explain that again. Cause so, you're yeah. Fast. So uh, initially it was for migraines. Remember That's back, right, you had horrible yeah, migraines. Yeah, I'm, I'm horrible migraines. But I remember in 2000, I went to a doctor who gave me a 100 Vicodin with a 100 refill. That, back then, they did that. And uh, became addicted quickly. Then I hurt my shoulder, went to extra strength Vicodin. Then in about 2004, 2005, started on the OxyContin until 2010, December, when I was off. So I've been clean for about 12 years. Did you ever get that stuff on the street? I got, I, listen. Did you get it from a friend that I, I got it? Uh, you, yeah, but hold on. That friend thought I was supporting an orphanage hospital. So he didn't know it was for you. He had no idea. He never would have given them to me. So because he's a good guy. But he is a good I guy. Introduced him yeah, him. he is a good guy, and I lied to him, and deceived him, and got the drugs uh, over a sustained period of time. So much to my shame. So you know, you're, you, listen. And today, today he admits, readily admits that the horror of, of this oxycontin. What is it? Oxycontin. Oxycontin yeah. Is that? with the fentanyl lacing in it, he probably would have been dead. But absolutely, and when, listen, you know, I work for Hope of the Valley, 
And one of the wonderful things I'm able to do is every Friday teach at the House of Hope, nine month recovery program, live in for men. And they work at Hope of the Valley, wonderful guys. They're, I just, it's, I love those men. I'm la- there every Friday. And I say to them, re- relapse is a death sentence today. It wasn't six years ago, but it is today. So your, your sobriety is an urgency. And of course, it's a Christian based program. So I teach a Bible study there on, on Fridays uh, for the last three years. I love it. Uh, but the lesson to be learned when I was a pastor was, and this is what I wanted to get across to the people by doing the docuseries, was look at the evil I committed. Uh, betraying the church and the people that love me 14 years. How did you betray the church? I think by uh, living a double life, a duplicitous life. I had such a good elder board. If I went to them and said I'm addicted to drugs or porn or having an affair or uh, uh, commingling funds, they would have figured out a way to get me help first, minister to the family, taking care of the kids, and, and, and help me recover. But I had too much pride. I didn't want to drop my guard. I didn't want somebody to have something on me. So I hid the addiction, hid the double life and the duplicitous life. And the reason I did this uh, docuseries is so people wouldn't do that, but also think of all the evil I did. I did a lot of time for it, didn't get away with it. Another seven and a half years. My kids grew up without me, irreparable damage. A total of how many years? uh, 15. 15 years. So, So, but here's the point. If I could get my wife back, you were at the wedding Mm -hmm. when we remarried, my boys back, uh, the jobs that I have with Greg and with Hope of the Valley, the um, being able to even to tell my story. If I could do that, and I've done way more evil than anybody in your listening audience has, uh, has done, then how much more hope is there for them who are about to throw in the towel because of COVID and, and failure and addiction? I want them to know they have hope. They can come back. If I could get my life back, I've, listen, you may have done evil. You didn't rob God. You didn't betray God. Causing reproach on the name of Christ, worse sin you could commit, worse than murder. I committed it. God gave me another chance. He's the God of another chance, we say. Uh, I used to tell John Whitfield, our pastor who married me and uh, was my mentor in prison, he used to say, I said, I've blown my second chance. He goes, no, you need another chance. And we have a God of another chance. So I don't care how many times you've blown it. If I could come back, how much more can you? And that's the encouragement that I want to give people who are are listening that, uh, you know, Forgiveness doesn't change the world, Michael. Forgivers change the world. And my wife, Lisa, as you know, she's a dear friend of yours and Cammie's, is a forgiver. My boys, Dylan's first thing he looked at me when I got out of prison in 2018, I don't know you. Today we're uh, close. We worked out at the gym every morning at 4.30 with his friends for years, for a couple years. Uh, we rebuilt the relationship, we go to church every Sunday. So forgivers, the church people that many of them, some that were in leadership have forgiven me. Forgivers, when you have done what I've done. You are so grateful for the forgivers in your life. And I know I am for Lisa, the boys, the former church that I hurt, many of the people there, uh, the people I interact with every day. I am grateful for forgivers. You know, and it's a good point. I just want to expand upon that. Barry did this, King of the Con. You got to watch it, okay? Because he wanted to show people that number one, you can make a comeback. You can be forgiven. You can do the right thing, no matter how many times you fail. And look at me, look, 20 some odd years on the street. Every day, every day I spent in violation of both God's laws and the laws of man. I was a criminal. No way to sugarcoat it. You know, oh, Michael, you weren't that. I was a criminal. End of story. You know, who's better than this and who's worse? It doesn't matter. I was doing the wrong thing knowingly and willingly. And I got a second chance and even a third chance. And, you know, I come across people all the time because I speak all over the world. Ex-drug addicts will come to me. You know, Michael, how is there going to be a purpose for me? Look what I've done in my life. And I say, hey, who better than you? You've cleaned up your act to go and minister and talk to and counsel people that are going through that problem now. Mm. You're the real thing. You have Mm. credibility. Credibility is 90% of everything when you're trying to change somebody or tell somebody, don't do what I did and look at how I've been able to help myself. And that's what this is all about. And uh, people don't ever be discouraged. And, you know, there's going to be haters out there going to say, why did you have this guy on? Why did you do this? Why? Because he's my friend, number one. I believe in him. Who am I to judge him? I've done a lot of bad things in my life, too. I was blessed with the chances that I have now. And I know Barry's going to do the right thing. And that's many people that I talk to. I know they're going to turn their life around. And here's, just so you know, because there are naysayers in the docuseries, and I understand that. And the context of that is, I understand that. Um, That's why I did the time I did. That's why I was punished severely. 
But there's another component to that is you can't worry about when the toothpaste has been squeezed out of the tube, you can't put it back in. So there's nothing we can do about the past. What we can do is the present and the future. So every life has redemptive value. So just what you've done uh, and what I'm trying to do is leverage those experiences, one, to make sure you don't do what I did, and two, um, I always say my people are those who violate positions of trust, been in and out of prison, struggling with addiction, cast off by society. This docu-series is for you to give you hope. What other anybody else thinks, I'm not in a position of trust. I'm not a senior pastor, I'm not a hedge fund president or you know, trying to raise money, I'm not the president of a bank. My judge in 2011 said, you know what, Barry, you've uncovered all these frauds. Why don't you do this when you get out? Stay away from public companies because of greed and insider trading and do a public service and uncover private investment fraud. 10 years later, I get out. We have 11 cases with the SEC. As you know, two have already been shut down and six are open investigations. And I still won't get involved in that. And he still won't get involved. Uh, but but the, I did follow their advice, got the old team back together, some of them, and am and, and blessed and am grateful to be able to be, because you know why? 10 years after she made that comment in July of 2011, social media now has, on whatever you platform, investment opportunities guaranteeing 10, 20, 30% returns. Oh, Michael, yeah. returns so high that if they were true, you wouldn't need to, need to raise money in the first place. Exactly. So, so, there, and yet, the law enforcement is hopelessly overwhelmed with with uh, the there's amount. No way of, they can do it. Yeah, no, and there's no investigative reporters hardly in newsrooms anymore because they're cut back. So I'm on the front lines and and trying to prevent people from investing in investment frauds by proactively getting companies that are committing material fraud, skin of the truth, stuffed with the lie, shut down proactively before they compile a huge victim list. So right now, you're dedicating a good, good part of your life to helping people not get taken into a fraudulent yeah. situation, lose their money, lose whatever. And, uh, and that's a good thing. And I know you're very capable of doing that because, again, we understand fraud. I'm not as good as him, but I probably can get into it, too. I'm always very weary when somebody comes to me with some great deal. I got to tell a Michael Francis story, though. There are two I got to tell before we close. Right. Number one is one of those cases is a big deal. It's a billion dollar fraud and there's six investigations open on this particular company. There was an article that came that they had mob connections. So I was scared to death and I'm like, I called Michael, I'm like, do I have anything to worry about? Michael says, well, let me check this out for you. And even if there is, I'll take care of it because you didn't know that they were involved and you know, these right. guys, it's their fault. So I still came back to you again. Secondly, I got to tell you, when I first got out of prison, uh, my wife Lisa works at Toby Tobin and um, full-time manages uh, the Malibu branch, but they used to be in Brentwood before they moved right. to. So you and Cam came out, I had just been out, and I got a letter uh, for a tax bill that they needed immediately. I mean, I was paying restitution and finances were tight, and you and Cam are there and Lisa and I are there, and it was like 3,000 something dollars. And uh, I told you about it. The next day, there was a, a, a Zelle to my account. You covered the taxes, which put me right with probation I got right off on the right foot because of that, paying that current. I don't know what I would have done without it. You never even said a word about it years later. And these are the kinds of things that you do for me and so many others in the trenches that nobody's aware of because you certainly won't talk about it. And Kurt sits behind a camera. We can't get him to say anything. <laughs> so, so you know, there's nobody who knows all the things you do for me. I love you. I'm grateful for you. And for 32 years, you've been bailing my sorry butt out of one problem or another and I'm grateful and when you talk about forgiveness and forgivers you're a forgiver and I'm grateful for you well listen you're like a younger brother what can I say but uh, this time I think you really got it right you know sometimes <laughs> sometimes we just we just get too old I'm a slow learner I'm a slow learner, a slow learner. we get too kids, old right? you know yeah. it's funny so many guys I met in prison you know that have done a lot of time 20 25 30 years I said, what are you going to do when you get out? They said, Michael, I ain't going to commit no more crime. I'm just too old. You know, yeah, it's right, like you yeah. get worn out after a while. And, you know, the judge, her advice was stay away from positions of trust where yeah. there's a temptation. Good advice. You know, you're a good leader. I'm not. So that's okay. I have other strengths, but if I if I hedge against that, it's going to help me never repeat offend again. Listen, I am. Uh, I was very happy to have you on. We, we've been waiting for this, you know, because we knew that this King yeah. of the Con was going to come on and great series. I really encourage everybody to watch it. Three hours, a lot of stuff you're going to learn. It's a great story, and now you've spoken to the principal, the guy, the subject, and I can tell you that his efforts to turn his life around are real. 
doing a lot of wonderful things. He works at Hope of the Valley, giving his time and his efforts to help the homeless. It's a tremendous organization. I'm going to be involved with them in some way. I've spoke to the two principals, great guys. And uh, he's just doing the right thing. Got his family back together. You know, you can make so many mistakes in life, but there always comes a time when you can turn it around. It's never too late. Don't listen to anybody who tells you it can't happen. It's not true. And it's never too late. It's never too early. And it's never too late to change your life and do the right thing in life. And Barry's an example of that. And you told me to close last time, before I came, you said, you know, I want you to look in the camera and talk to somebody who has I do. been... And, and so what I would say is to encourage somebody who's out there living a double life that nobody knows about, addicted, uh, in and out of prison, you know, cast off, whatever. What I would say is there are three men at Hope of the Valley that, that I met um, in the trenches, uh, Joe, Oscar, and Miguel. And they were on the street, they were addicted to drugs. They went to the nine month program at Hope of the Valley. They turned their lives around. And today, they're employees at Hope of the Valley. Miguel ran an emergency shelter during COVID in North Hollywood with me night and day in 2020. I love Miguel. Um, Oscar is one of the most amazing men you'd ever meet. Uh, his wife, uh, ex-wife said, you will never amount to anything. You're a drug addict. He's clean and sober. He's killing it, uh, uh, doing great and, and, and walking with God and, and not using and Joe, uh, Joe's probably, Joe's the guy who could fix anything. Any of our, um, we have 22 locations, Joe's the guy who fixes everything. So, uh, and his life is a miracle uh, of recovery. So these three men are my encouragement. They're who I look up to and I respect. Came from the street, drug addiction. People can change. Some of us are slow learners, mm -hmm. but never throw in the towel. And uh, God is not the God of a second chance. He's the God of another chance. Yes, and it's uh, honestly, Barry, it's one thing that I love about our faith. They never give up on us. God never gives up on us, no mm. matter what condition that we are in. Sometimes, like you said, slow learners, we got to go through trials and tribulations, and we, a lot of it we bring on ourselves. Sometimes we can't control it, uh, but we have a very loving and merciful and gracious God who will always give us that second chance, and uh, I appreciate it. I know you do. Thanks for having me. Thank you. King of the Con. Go and watch it. It's on Discovery Plus, and uh, I guarantee you're going to like it, and you've seen the real guy, the main guy. Tune in. Discovery Plus, King of the Con. I know you're going to watch it, and it's a good story, redemptive story. You heard more now than you'll probably hear in the documentary, things that, that he talked about now that weren't put in there. You know how they do these things, but it's a great, great, great series. Watch it. You'll love it. And our people always remember this. We have a God of second, third, fourth, a hundred chances. You're never too late to turn your life around no matter what people think. I don't care if it was drug, alcohol, pornography, whatever it might be. There is a point in time when that bell goes off and you can make a change. And don't let anybody discourage you. There are haters out there that are always going to you know, say, oh, you can't do this. You're too bad. You're too evil. Hey, you just saw two examples. Mob guy on the street 25 years grace of God now back in a, in a different situation in his life, doing okay. Barry Minkow, the same thing, did 15 years in prison. Remember, this is somebody that paid the price, not like today when people are getting away with stuff. He paid the price for his crime. He didn't get away with anything. Came out, got his family back together, doing some wonderful things. And uh, these are the kind of stories that I want to talk about because we want to give encouragement and hope to people out there. Everybody needs it. So that's it for today. How do I always leave you? Same way. Be safe. Be healthy. I sincerely mean this. God bless all of you. And yes, I'll see you next time. Take care.